Welcome to Social Venture Partners Dallas. We are here digitally once again in hopes that we will soon be in person for this luncheon series. It's pretty difficult to eat lunch digitally with everyone, but we're going to make the most of it and feel free to, to have a snack or maybe even a beverage of your choice, uh, depending on what the rest of your afternoon is like. You know, the Social Innovation Lunch Series started maybe 15 years ago as to meet one of the goals and objectives of Social Venture Partners, which is to educate our audience on the most impactful ways to spend their philanthropic dollars. Now we understand that philanthropic dollars and business dollars and personal life and all of these things are merging in ways that they have never merged before. And so we are excited to bring this panel of experts together to share a little bit about uh, the future of impact investing. For, for SVP, we have been at this work for a number of years now as of each of these panelists. So we are grateful for them for bringing their expertise to our audience. For those of you who are joining a Social Venture Partner event for the first time, Social Venture Partners is an organization made up of people who want to give their time, their talent, and their financial resources to grow the capacity of nonprofit organizations as well as for-profit for good organizations. So we are delighted here to have Donovan Irvin with us. As many of you will recall, Donovan served on the staff at Social Venture Partners and is uh, currently, his life work is at the intersection of climate justice and finance. He serves as a finance officer for the High Fund, and I'm going to turn it over to Donovan. I am most excited that Donovan has joined us at Social Venture Partners as a partner, and I am deeply appreciative to him for lending his, consultant, his consultancy excellence to me and helping me think about the way we should be delivering messages to our audience about these important topics. So without further ado, Donovan, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Tony, and thanks for your ongoing leadership to help just bring create space for these types of conversations and conversations in Dallas. Hi, everyone. Um, as Tony mentioned, my name is Donovan Irvin, and I'm thankful to be the, the moderator for today. As Tony mentioned as well, I currently work at the High Fund for Climate and Gender Justice a philanthropic intermediary that raises funds and makes grants to groups that have historic, historically lacked access to funding and that are addressing the intersecting climate, gender, and racial justice crises in the US, particularly in the US South. My role as the climate finance officer sits at the intersection of philanthropy and finance. I'm looking to leverage grant dollars to accelerate impact investment in projects and companies that have an explicit environmental and justice focus. We see money as a tool to bring about social justice and ecological restoration. And my personal mission is to help push the conversation about how investors define return, risk, and yes, impact. So it gives me great pleasure to be a part of this conversation about the future of impact investing around the country and particularly here at home in Dallas. As you can see, we have an outstanding panel of experts who will bring important perspectives. We have Otho Kerr, who's the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Community Impact Investing at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. We also have Dominic Ramos-Ruiz, a member of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's Community Development Team, as well as Heather Gilker, the Founder and Principal of Tokalon Advisors, Executive Director of North Texas Swan Impact Network, and a proud SVP Dallas partner. I encourage you to read, read their bios on the event description but in the interest of time, we'll move along to the program. Otho and Dominic will start, start us with some framing remarks, explaining their work at the Fed in New York, and then we'll bring Heather into the mix. She'll explain the impact investing work that SQB Dallas and Swan is leading here in Dallas, and then we'll open it up for dialogue. And so without further ado, we'll pass it over to you, uh, Otho and Dominic, to, to, lead your, to lead the framing thoughts. Thank you, Donovan. And thank you, Tony, for inviting us uh, to this SVP event. Uh, and man, we would love to fly to Dallas for one of these in-person lunches, I can tell you. And it's nice to be on the platform and stage with Heather as well. Um, Dominic and I are going to uh, share some high-level observations on impact investing for those who uh, are new to the space, unfamiliar, but then share some observations that we have on where we see some energy in terms of the future of impact investing. And then we'd love to engage you all in some conversation as uh, Donovan feels appropriate. But I'm gonna 
turn the mic over to uh, Dominique and then uh, I will follow up with my own remarks. Great, th thanks, Otto. Um, before I continue or before I, I begin, um, just have to give it a disclaimer that the views uh, that Otho and I express are uh, our own and, and do not necessarily reflect those of the New York Fed or anyone in the Federal Reserve System. So uh, with that housekeeping uh, remark over, I will now begin. Um, so I'd first like to set the stage by providing some background on our team, which is the community development team at the New York Fed and, and the unique role that we're aiming to play in this ever evolving world of, of impact investing. So at a very high level, uh, our team engages with a variety of community stakeholders uh, and cross-sector leaders to, to better understand and to ultimately help address systemic challenges that are being faced by underserved communities within our district. Our district being New York, our New York State, Northern New Jersey, um, Fairfield, Connecticut, US Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. Uh, it's a function that actually exists within every one of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks and their districts and was originally born uh, for those who might be familiar out of the Community Reinvestment Act in the 1970s. And that was really to help encourage financial institutions uh, to help meet the credit needs of low and moderate communities. And of course, uh, given that each uh, district looks different, uh, each bank has their own set of priorities and approaches that really reflect the different dynamics uh, that exist within each respective uh, regional economy. So in New York, uh, which is where, where we are, uh, we've been advancing this mission in a few new ways. Uh, one being really by using the research and analytics capacity um, of the Federal Reserve and uh, the New York Fed to really substantiate community level insights and help raise awareness to socioeconomic challenges that are faced by, again, low and moderate income communities. And two, by engaging in research partnerships that uh, help really size up the economic impacts of these issues, as well as their potential solutions. Uh, the third piece of this is really leveraging the convening power of the Fed to bring together both likely and unlikely partners who together can scale innovative and impactful business models or policies. Uh, and ultimately, the part that's, that's very exciting to us is really um, this role of connecting capital providers, whether corporate, philanthropic, institutional, to new impact investment opportunities that could have a meaningful impact on jobs, on the economy, and on the communities that, that we serve within our district. So um, I think it's important to note that much of this, uh, particularly that capital connecting piece, uh, reflects a new strategic plan that kicked off in earnest uh, last year, just after, or actually just before Odo and I began uh, our, our roles at, at the New York Fed. So in this plan, we've really focused our attention on three key areas, uh, the first being the economic drivers of health, the second being climate related risk, and the third being household financial well being. Uh, these are the three that we're focused on, that, uh, but while we are focused on these areas, we are looking at other issues around workforce development, around housing. But as part of the strategic plan, we've really doubled down on these three areas. Uh, and from here, we've already begun to, to dig into emerging solutions, uh, particularly in the areas of food insecurity, maternal health, energy adaptation, digital inclusion. So looking at uh, digital divide issues across our district, also communicating with other community development teams across other reserve banks to understand best practices, to understand uh, different approaches that they've taken that we can learn from. So uh, we decided to focus on these areas just because they all carry really economic consequences, right? So many of, of which have been brought to light, obviously over the past couple of years. And uh, we've seen how, for example, climate disasters can massively disrupt labor markets and supply chains. And today we're still experiencing the impacts of, of a public health crisis that continues to disproportionately impact people who are the backbone of our economies. So uh, to help reinforce this new approach or this new way of working, we've expanded our staff with expertise from the financial and capital markets, the impact investing field to refer to what we, uh, or to refer to what we now create, uh, what we now have or call uh, the uh, capital connector team. So 
Otho has really been leading the, the charge there. And as somebody who's relatively new to the impact investing space, I have to say that I've learned quite a bit under his leadership uh, over the past 10 months, uh, having really very little experience in impact investing. And uh, despite that, I think that having uh, worked for a social impact startup prior to joining the Fed, that you know, this has been even an even more enriching experience just because I've been able to apply a new lens to better understanding the ecosystem that enabled that business and, and so many others to thrive into impactful and profitable business models. So with that, I, I just want to take the next few moments to share a bit about what I've learned over the past few months. Uh, for some of you who might be newer to impact investing, uh, a field that's involved quite a bit since it was first coined in 2007, uh, when the Rockefeller Foundation convened this group of, of pioneers who understood that there were incredible intractable problems associated with the environment and with social issues that could not be solved and funded by the government or philanthropy alone. So uh, today, where we stand uh, more than 10 years later, it's not really an investment class, but rather a philosophy that has permeated the investment landscape and has reshaped the way that we think about business and the role and, and responsibilities that business leaders have in meeting the needs of society. And all actors and capital providers have, have a role to play in, in this movement, uh, which leads me to a slide that I'm gonna pull up on how this capital can be deployed. Um, All right, can somebody, can somebody tell me if you see this? Good, all right. Uh, let's see, I appear to have lost my video in the process. Okay, uh, there we go. All right, so this slide as we've been engaging with a lot of different types of capital providers, really understanding the landscape. Um, I found this slide, which is really describing the spectrum of capital. And so what I'll begin with is, is just sort of starting with philanthropy and working my way across and uh, philanthropy sort of having the, having paved the way for impact investing given their unique role and, and providing capital without necessarily having an interest in the uh, financial return. So philanthropy, this is donating to the food pantry because you want underserved individuals in your community to be, to be fed. Uh, this is also donating to organizations like the Nature Conservancy because you want to protect the waterways or animal habitats in, in your respective regions or others, all without, again, that expectation of receiving a financial return. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have these investments that are solely about maximizing return. These decisions have no necess uh, necessarily no return uh, or no concern for the impact of the capital's deployment unless you define that impact as financial return. Uh, of course, the area that we're all very interested in and what's brought us all here today is this sweet spot, uh, this sort of magical area in the middle, uh, if you will, of, of deploying capital with that combination of social and financial returns. This is impact investing. So this is the fintech company, for example, that's helping to uh, really provide access to capital, help build credit for low-income communities uh, through technology solutions, or a food tech company, one that we've been working with at the New York Fed, is helping to connect commercial kitchens to local food pantries through a technology platform to help them minimize food waste, uh, but also distribute that excess food to food pantries to address the daily health or, or hunger needs of, of their constituents. So uh, these are the investments that are, are motivated by measurable positive impacts on the environment, on the community with regard to social issues. And, even within the spectrum or within this spectrum and within impact investing, there's this spectrum of impact investors. 
And that has been particularly interesting for me just to see that there are so many different types of impact investors um, that exist. And one, for example, being Acumen, where, where Otho was prior to the New York Fed, uh, being an institutional or, or being a philanthropy backed uh, capital provider, they can afford to take on a little bit more risk than an impact investor, maybe from BlackRock or from, from TPG. And so that's a unique role, as is endowments, which are also looking at these investments in a different way than, than institutional sort of impact investing. So um, with that, I think it's also important to note that, and, and what's often confused even within uh, the, this world, within people who kind of do this day to day or who are really um, taking it on in a serious way is this confusion between uh, sustainable investing, responsible investing and impact investing. And so often those things are all kind of bundled into one. And so I think that with that, I'll, I'll really just note that sustainable investing really puts emphasis on businesses that are socially conscious uh, than simply avoiding risks. And, and that sort of gets you into the responsible investing, which is more focused on avoiding those risks. So that perhaps is where the ESG that, that we all have come to know quite well uh, really lives. So that's the responsible investing. And they also have different ways of measuring impact. And, and so ESG, you have GRI reporting, you have ESG reporting that lives often within CSR, or you know, now you have teams that are completely devoted to measuring ESG metrics. And, and that looks very different than the metrics that impact investors, true impact investors that are, that are looking at deep impact, they're going to be looking at very social metrics. And so that's probably enough for, for me. Uh, I think that you know, that opens up another subject that Otho will, will talk about as he talks about the future of impact investing uh, and how um, that measurement piece really distinguishes or, or differentiates impact investors from other types of investors along the spectrum of capital. So Otho, I will kick it over to you. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, high level overview. Um, and as I said, it's a delight for me to be here today. Uh, we were asked to talk a bit about impact investing, give a high level overview, but give some thoughts on what uh, we see as far as the future of impact investing. I'm gonna repeat what Dominic said already uh, because we all have to say, as required by the Fed, uh, the remarks I'm about to say, I have to say are delivered and they are my own and don't necessarily re reflect the views of the Federal Reserve System or anyone else within the Federal Reserve System. Um, we're so fortunate to be here today to talk to you all. Um, and uh, we're especially fortunate because it is Black History Month. We're in the middle of Black History Month. And for that reason, I'd be remiss to not lift up some observations in that context, especially given the fact that our job is focused on driving capital, especially impact investment capital toward funding solutions that will support underserved communities. Let's start with this. Even if you don't know the exact statistics, you probably know enough to appreciate that Black and Latinx Americans are four times more likely than their white counterparts to be hospitalized due to COVID. For BIPOC communities, that equates to lost wages and lost wealth at a greater rate than for white people. And I don't have to explain the inequitable economic impact of that statistic, it stands on its own. It shows you how health inequities lead to wealth inequities, but wealth inequities lead to health inequities and so on. Our job at the bank is to inspire capital providers and drive capital toward finding solutions that will tackle such disparities, essentially leveraging markets to affect change. But you may be wondering why two guys from the Fed at home, a feel at home talking to you about impact investing in its future. And let me tell you a bit about me, the Fed, and then connect all of that and the work that our team is doing, described in part by Dominic, to some emerging activity in the impact investing arena. These are thoughts that I shared actually at the Yale School of Management last week, but the feedback was so positive, I'm eager to share them again with you. As Dominic said, we've been at the Fed for only 10 months. For the 14 years prior to that, I was unwittingly helping to build the impact investing sector. Back in 2008, 
I became a founding partner in an impact investment firm just months after, as Dominic referred to, just months after the term was coined. Little did we know when we founded Echo Asset Management Partners, which later became uh, and merged with uh, Wolfenson Fund Management, but became Encourage Capital, that it was the start of this extraordinary impact investing movement, driving capital towards solutions to problems that government and philanthropy could not finance on their own. Today, the impact investing market, according to a 2020 survey by the GIN, which is the Global Impact Investing Network, is a $715 billion market ranging from, as Dominic mentioned earlier, philanthropically backed investors such as Acumen, where I served as chief investment officer uh, prior to being lured to the Fed, all the way to the more mainstream funds, such as Bain Double Impact, who are looking for market returns. Before I joined the Fed, the Fed's mission seemed clear and simple to me. The Fed was that institution that adjusted interest rates when the economy needed a nudge or when the economy needed a tap on the brakes in order to slow or reverse rising prices, also known as today. But I learned before joining the Fed that it's so much more than what I knew. And here's how. Responding to the challenges of the 1970s when the U.S. was faced with stagflation, some of you remember rising prices and high unemployment. Congress updated the Fed's mission and stated that the Fed's goals should be, quote, maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. These are, these are referred to as the dual mandate. What's of particular interest to us, and it's connected to the work that we do, is the maximum employment component of the mandate. Last summer, Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic offered that, quote, maximum employment means everyone has the opportunity for gainful employment and work that is consistent with their full potential, which, re which requires, he added, the dismantling of barriers that prevent folks from fully participating in the economy or deprive them of the opportunity to contribute to output and growth. At the New York Fed, our, our explicit mission is, in part, to make the economy stronger for all segments of society. And Dominic's and my group is doing that by identifying and driving capital towards solutions to problems that are the barriers that prevent underserved communities, especially communities of color, from equitably participating in the U.S. economy. You can see the role that impact investing can have working alongside us and the work that we do. And of course, we know that our work today is perhaps more important than it was prior to the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, the earnings differential between black and white workers was wide, a gap that can't be fully explained by differences in age, education, job type, or location. Given the existing rules and systems in America, COVID has merely exacerbated these gaps. Take New York City, the Bronx in particular, where 90% of the residents are minority. In just the second quarter of 2020, right after the pandemic began, employment of the Bronx dropped 18% compared to 2019. This opportunity gap is not only a drag for the folks who are confronted with these challenges, but it's a drag on the entire economy. It prevents us from achieving our fullest potential. As San Francisco Fed President Mayor da Daly said, leaving these gaps unaddressed is clearly unfair, but it's also unproductive. It keeps millions of people on the sidelines or underutilized and sells the economy short. She added, no entrepreneur would ever stand for it. The question is, why do we? In their research, my San Francisco Fed colleagues found that systemic disparities and inequitable opportunities excuse me, inequitable opportunities by race, gender, socioeconomic status, and a myriad of other indicators results in a misallocation or complete sidelining of talent that ultimately bridles economic growth. Analyzing the years from 1990 to 2019 and eliminating gaps in employment, hours, and education, giving racial and ethnic minorities the values of their white counterparts, they found that the U.S. economy would have had about $34 trillion in 2019 dollars more output during that period if gaps in labor market opportunities and returns hadn't existed. Our team at the Fed is focused on closing these gaps for communities of color and other underserved communities. And in the spirit of strengthening communities and positioning individuals to fully participate in the economy by mitigating the risk that might get in the way of their doing so, we're eagerly implementing, implementing a new a strategic plan, as Dominic pointed out, that connects emerging solutions with funding to foster racial equity and improve life for underserved communities. As Dominic said, we're focusing on three key areas, household financial stability, climate adaptation, resilience, and health equity. 
we're taking time to uncover impactful solutions in all of these areas. And in the area of household financial stability, we're looking for strategies that will help families withstand economic shocks that can sometimes derail them. In the area of climate adaptation and resilience, we're complementing the efforts to mitigate climate change with efforts to help communities that will be subject to the adverse impacts of climate change. In urban communities, that could be extreme heat and in rural communities, extreme drought. And finally, we hope to invest in the long-term wellness of communities and individuals by focusing on the social determinants of health. In parallel with our search for solutions, we're looking to prime all sorts of capital, including traditional impact investing, community development, government, and philanthropic capital to work together as appropriate to fund these solutions. Having been an impact in, 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 uh, investment banker and an impact investor, I see the opportunity for different types of capital that don't necessarily collaborate too often to come together, collaborate and work together in new ways. But I think the success of our work will not only be found in investing in solutions that mitigate risk for these underserved communities, but in solutions that will also build wealth and close the racial wealth gap. It's this kind of wealth leads to better health outcomes, creates greater financial resiliency and builds a foundation for future wealth appreciation. In 2019, the typical U.S. Black family had $24,000 in net worth and the typical Latino family $36,000, both compared to the typical white family, which had $189,100 in net worth. $24,000 for Black families, $189,000 for white families. It's not hard to see which families are more likely to be able to withstand an economic shock or a pandemic. Wealth matters, but structural barriers limit families of color. Well, I know this is obvious to some folks, it bears repeating until it really sinks into everyone's consciousness. Telling Black and Latinx families that they can now participate in the economy without America fully acknowledging historical inequities is like telling a player to jump into a monopoly game an hour after play has begun and to compete on equal terms with the players who have already purchased all of the property on all four sides of the board. In the absence of wealth, meaningful generational transfers of wealth can't happen, denying these communities the resources to reinvest in their growth and prosperity. If we don't fix these inequities, the racial wealth gap will continue to yawn, burdening the entire economy. So, so how do we fix this? Let's talk about an idea that is gaining more and more traction among impact investors, community wealth building models. Back in the fall, I had the joy of interviewing Stephanie Swepson Titty on a podcast uh, hosted uh, Steph, Stephanie Swepson Twitty, I'm sorry, on a podcast hosted by Faith and Finance. Stephanie lives in Asheville, North Carolina, and is president and CEO of Eagle Market Street's Development Corporation. In the course of the interview, she told me about a fund EMSDC was launching to solve a problem that many BIPOC communities have to face, the absence of funding for local entrepreneurs who don't have the friends or family who often see ideas in white communities. Each year, about 30% of startup ventures receive capital from friends and family. And friends and family have historically been the most common source of external capital for business entre entrepreneurs. But what about those communities that haven't had the benefit of asset ownership and wealth accumulation because of history systemic barriers? Stephanie is solving this problem by turning the local churches and their members who have an interest in revitalizing their communities by supporting local entrepreneurs who have investable ideas. In fact, she and Kevin Jones of Faith and Finance are partnering with other congregations in the US to create funds that help local entrepreneurs who don't otherwise have the wealthy friends and family who would be willing to take an equity stake in their business. Through their tithings, church members are giving to their communities and also partaking in the upside. This is impact investing, place-based impact investing. In a recent report, the Urban Institute explained the need for community wealth building models, given how BIPOC communities have been excluded from wealth building strategies, including home ownership, which is perhaps the most important of these strategies. But Black and Latinx households have been denied an equitable opportunity to build wealth through home ownership for two particular reasons. First, because of discriminatory practices, Blacks in the US have a stubbornly low level of home, home ownership, explain, explaining great part the delta between black and white net worth that I noted earlier. But even for those black families who have had the opportunity to purchase a home, the value of their homes are undervalued relative 
to comparable white homes, again, due to systemically discriminatory factors. Andre Perry of the Brookings Institute found that homes in black communities are undervalued by 23%, the equivalent of $48,000 per home. That equates to $156 billion in lost value, the equivalent of 4.4 million new businesses. And BIPOC communities have suffered disparate wealth up outcomes with other asset cut categories as well, ranging from employer-sponsored retirement plans to business ownership. While the community wealth building models can't replace the lost wealth BIPOC communities have endured, the Urban Institute notes that these models are providing a new form of funding for folks who might not otherwise have access to friends and family funding, making home ownership and decision-making stakes more accessible to populations who have traditionally not been able to participate as equity, equity stakeholders in their own community's economy and share in the benefits of wealth appreciation. In a report that we commissioned last year, the US Impact Investing Alliance offered that these investment funds, many of which are raising capital from small dollar non-accredited investors, but now impact investors themselves, if smaller ticket, are unique in that they embed a democratic process to engage their community investor base to set fund priorities and make key decisions. This restorative form of investing shifts power so as to counter historical systemic inequities. The Urban Institute has identified four conceptual wealth building models. One, neighborhood crowdfunding in which individuals have fractional ownership in an income producing property or business. Occupant equity which, in which individuals pool their capital which might be supported with government or philanthropic capital to acquire devalued property, taking it out of the grasp of speculators and creating business operating space for locals or perhaps affordable housing. Three, local institutional equity in which local institutions or community-based organizations acquire a stake in local real estate to generate a revenue stream for mission-based initiatives. And four, a neighborhood nonprofit trust or endowment in which a nonprofit organization partners with locals to create a perpetual pool of capital from which local grants can be made. We don't have time for me to provide an example of each one of these models, but let me lift up one example that has taken root in New England the Ujima project in Boston. This is an example of impact investing at its finest. It's a well-regarded example of neighborhood crowdfunding. Ujima means collective work and responsibility in Swahili. Ujima launched the Democratic Investment Fund in 2018, seeking to raise $5 million. This impact investing fund lends to small businesses owned by people of color. I love it for two reasons. First, it's democratically driven. Its members determine what the economic priorities are for their community and then decide based on sound data, which potential investees they should invest in. Second, and this is what's really cool, they have a terrifically interesting capital stack. Their first tier of investors includes non-accredited investors in Massachusetts who can purchase notes from $50 to $10,000. Philanthropic capital funds a loan loss reserve to mitigate risk for this first tier of investors. The second tier includes accredited investors from the state and neighboring states, and they can purchase notes from $1,000 to $250,000. And the third tier is for philanthropic investors who can invest $5,000 or more. But most is interestingly, so as to enable communities to meaningful, meaningfully combat wealth inequities, Rather than perpetuate them, Ujima has upended the traditional fund return waterfall by ensuring that the first capital return to the fund is distributed first to the first tier small uh, donor investors, reflecting the proportionate risk that they've assumed relative to their total assets. The beauty of this fund and other community wealth building models is that impact investors are giving power to the community to deploy capital where they believe the greatest needs are while also providing a wealth creation opportunity. This willingness to shift power is the great next step in impact investing. Since 2007, the Impact Investing Universe has trained its sites on measuring environmental and social impacts. The sector is realizing, however, that that's not enough. Impact requires a shift in power as well. The only way the status quo will be disrupted and old systemic patterns forgotten is for us to follow in the footsteps of Ujima and address historical hierarchies. The Urban Institute offers whatever the desired social and environmental impact of their investment, an impact investor should set a power shifting goal and focus on achieving it as much as they focus on social, environmental, and financial returns. For each investment, a portfolio of investments or field building initiative, impact investors should 
be able to describe how it shifted power away from themselves and toward the community served, and they should know what more needs to be done. As a great civil rights activist and heroine of mine, Ella Baker said, give light and people will find a way. These models do just that. And I encourage each of you to think about what you can do as an impact investor to shift power and to help historically disadvantaged communities build wealth that history has denied them. Thank you. Thank you both, uh, Otho and Dominique, for that incredible overview of, of your work and the way that you're trying to approach and shift the conversation around impact investing. Um, I really appreciated this, the point around really thinking about the, the systemic com component, the systemic barriers, the historical barriers that, uh, that definitely pervade the impact investing landscape as well. And how do we be mindful of those as we're making investments, as we're starting to shift capital, how can we shift power dynamics as well? Um, one thing that I was curious about as you both were describing your work is how to how to make this a little bit more concrete in terms of the Fed's role in this. Um, one one point of that is what is the role or or how how is community involved with how you all are thinking about this work? How how do you relate? How are you in relationship with the community so that their voices can be reflected in the research that you all are putting out and the and the convenings that you all are, are leading. I'll stop there and see if y'all have any thoughts or reactions. Yeah, I'll, I'll start by saying that uh, one, of the, uh, one of our strengths is our convening power. And uh, we can bring all sorts of stakeholders to the table very easily. And um, uh, what we are trying to do more and more of is to make sure that we not only hear from the capital providers, corporate America, but increasingly, as I said, from the communities not only the community-based organizations, but from actual members of the communities who are not necessarily represented through CBOs and the like. Um, uh, it, in, inside the Fed, for the last nine months, I've been co-chairing a committee called the Equitable Growth Priority Leadership Team. And we are a committee represented from members from throughout the bank, um, uh, not only in community development, but members from our supervisory, a uh, group from our markets group, uh, groups from throughout, uh, who are responsible for implementing monetary policy, who are responsible for uh, uh, regulating banks. And what we're trying to do is come together to figure out what can we all do to ensure equitable growth. And what we mean by equitable growth is making sure that the economy is far more inclusive than it is today, that we can do, we do what we can do to um, uh, take down barriers to uh, full economic participation. And a lot of that requires having the research, the right data. So we are going to be making, uh, uh, taking great strides to make sure that we capture the right data to understand how communities are, are excelling or how they are not um, uh, excelling. And I think for us, understanding the data requires collecting data that's important to those communities as well. So it's not only community that's of data that's important to us, but I think it's going to be important for us to listen to communities and say, what is the data that's required to help these, uh, these communities thrive and build? Um, uh, that's, I, I, Dominic, I don't know if you have anything you wanna to add to that, but those are some of my quick thoughts. Yeah, we have, we have a few, uh, well, more than a few advisories as well that, that really bring together uh, different community leaders um, at, at all different scales. And uh, we, we do that quarterly, really to gather insights that otherwise wouldn't uh, be captured in an economic analysis. And so it's all about really filling in those, those gaps in between the, the data points to, to really understand what is happening on the ground. And that often informs our research uh, on our team, on the community development team, also for the research on the, the research and uh, econo economics team. So um, that's one way. And then one, one thing that we've noticed just working with capital providers, working with community sort of stakeholders as we have been um, all along is, is that those two haven't actually talked to each other very much. So community like CDFIs and impact investors or corporations in some degrees and, and, and community development organizations haven't all talked. And so it's really amazing to see what is happening. And I think a lot of this happened with with the BLM movement of, of companies like um, Netflix, who are now investing a percentage of their balance sheet into CDFIs. 
and actually working with communities in ways that they hadn't before. And so uh, that's something that we hope to, to be able to bring to the table as well as, as serving up those community uh, voices to, to these capital providers. And one other thing that I wanted to just build on, maybe get a little bit a little bit deeper on was, although you mentioned the Boston Ujima project, which is just doing really incredible work around melding uh, this, these ideas of democracy and economic development and having, having, having this conversation to your point around power and, and, the, and the role of power in, in making these big uh, financial decisions. And so I'm curious um, if and how um, a, a, play, um, a stakeholder like the Fed would, would be involved with helping to make more, to make Boston Ujima project successful or, or other similar projects successful around, around your particular region? Is there, is, there, is there a role for the Fed to play in helping to prop up those types of uh, funds? I think the one thing that we can do is be a, a share of information. And as I said earlier, uh, inspire capital providers to think outside the box and to think, um, to understand that there are new ways to uh, uh, create wealth and to engage communities. Um, this uh, project with Ujima, it didn't happen overnight. It took them a while to come up with the structure and what a powerful structure it is. But I think they're, I, I, I think I'm, what, what we'd like to do is challenge anyone who has capital, especially impact investors and philanthropic uh, investors who can think a bit more outside the box, take a bit more risk to think what are the ways that they can really make sustainable change. And uh, you know, I was talking with some friends last night. We were talking about uh, maybe there's a role for impact investors every time they make an investment into a company or a project to figure out how a sleeve or a slice of their investment uh, actually gets um, allocated to employees so that the employees can participate in the upside of that investment and not just the impact investor, not just the uh, philanthropy. What are creative ways of redistributing um, wealth? And I, I, the, when, when we say redistribute wealth, I think that, that uh, that's a bit of a lightning rod. So I don't wanna say redistribute wealth, but find creative ways of allowing folks to participate in wealth that weren't otherwise uh, participating in wealth. And I think it does require folks to give up some of their power, give up some of their wealth, to help those underserved communities as opposed to, uh, it's very easy for many of us to sit in our ivory towers and think what we think is appropriate for a community, what is going to be helpful. Um, but I think a lot of that requires seeding of space and seeding of ground. I've been really impressed with some private foundations where they've gone into a community with a theory of change. They've had an idea of what that change uh, would look like uh, based on their proposed intervention, but after hearing from the community, realizing their proposed intervention is not necessarily welcomed or desired by that community, but other interventions would be. And so they pivoted in response to listening to the community. And I think more impact investors, philanthropic capital, traditional capital needs to listen to communities and react in an informed fashion. But our role is to make sure we get that message out there and help to re, re, uh, change narratives. Made a really important point around uh, if if we're really looking to achieve justice and achieve these these deep transformational um, uh, achievements, then we have to that those things have a cost. Uh, we have to be willing to give up power. We have to be willing to understand that there's a financial cost potentially as well to um, making these types of strides. And we have to we have to have those kinds of conversations. What are we willing to give up in order to achieve these values that we are saying that we hold? And I um, would love to bring Heather, love to bring you into this conversation. You've been doing some great work leading impact investing at SDP and in the in broader um, Dallas area. So we'd love to hear uh, more about your work and any reactions you may have to what Otho and Dominic have shared. Sure, well, I just feel like we are so fortunate to have you on today, Otho and Dominic. It's just really great and inspirational when I hear about the Ujima project and other things, it's really inspirational. I'm, I'm at this stage in life where I get goosebumps about that sort of thing because I came to what I do today from a very, um, you know, just get out of school, go be a banker, go be an equity analyst, be a portfolio manager at a family office, help families do things to 
maintain wealth, create more wealth. And at the end of it, I said, well, what, is, what do I want to say at the end of all this that I've accomplished? And I took a pause and I got really active with SVP Dallas. I'm so proud to be a partner. And um, that is, it's, it's been just a great experience. SVP is so good at convening. Um, they don't have the same balance sheet that you guys do, but they're really good and very creative at convening. And we said, what, can, what is it that we can do? We've talked about impact investment for years. And if you are providing pro bono consulting to nonprofits and social enterprises and you're helping them build capacity, you're an impact investor. And over the years, um, you know, SVP Dallas has invested in more recently for-profit entities uh, through a, a, a pitch competition that we have called Big Bang. And we've said, what, what is it that we could do more? Um, SVP founded um, a group called the Dallas Impact Investment Initiative. There's been a lot of education around that. And so as we think about how to educate, it's so wonderful to have you on. And then we think about, wow, I mean, the, the Fed, the New York Fed is so revered. You've got these amazing thought leaders. How can we bring this down to the participants on the call today? And how do we take this just wonderful approach, access to thought leadership, and make it real for us here in Dallas, Fort Worth, and in Texas, and in the region? And so I'm really proud of, of what SDP has done, and I'm, I'm excited about having made some connections we are collaborating now with an angel network called Swan Impact Network, and I help run that. Um, it's a really great group. So I'm spending my time today then having fun with my SVP partners. Some of those are angel investors that I've met. And when you look at Dallas, Dallas is one of the most philanthropic cities in the country consistently. And we're so creative at what we can bring to the table. Um, we can get ginormous projects done with philanthropic capital, no debt needed. It's amazing. We're just really good at thinking about it from a traditional perspective. And when I think about what are the things I'd like to change, I'd like to have those conversations and have those conversations with friends who say, you know, you are just so great at, uh, doing this uh, with your philanthropic capital, what if instead of you know the $25,000 table, which is really fun and does a lot for an organization, what if you took $25,000 and you parsed it up across five potential investments that are early stage startup? Not everybody has the capital to write $100,000 checks or even $25,000 checks. So Swan Impact Network has allowed us to bring an opportunity to our um, impact partners at SPP and beyond who can participate. And so it's all about you know, bringing access to capital. We are accredited investors. We'd love to democratize that and find ways to bring more investors in. But when I think about what we've done so far, my dollars are going further. So I can, I can invest in impact companies uh, the first screen that we have for these companies is what are the 17 sustainable development goals? Which one of those UN SDGs are you meeting? That's our first screen. And this, then, we, then we dig deep into what they're doing. So we're doing seed and early stage through series A. And uh, we've got 85 angels now. Um, most of them are in Texas, but they're beyond. We've got angels in New York and Wisconsin and Santa Barbara. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to demystify the investment process because it can be scary for a lot of people. We're trying to educate angels and also entrepreneurs. Uh, we also think that there are so many entrepreneurs out there that are inspirational, that are doing amazing things. And one thing that um, one of the, just one of the most successful, brightest, uh, six you know people that i know once said to me he said i just get pitched all the time from these nonprofits that want my donations i want to help these founders figure out a way that they can become sustainable so if they can create streams of sustainable revenue they don't have to come back to me next year 
So that gets me really excited. And so when I think about what SWAN is doing, it's not just, um, you know, we're, we're doing this, we're looking for, you know, double bottom line, uh, make a profit, but also do good in the world. And then when I look at what else we can do within our ecosystem and what SVP can do, we can also look at things where there may be a concession. There may be still a return that you want and that maybe it's a real estate related project that may not fit in that. So um, I'm excited to be working on this and I'm gonna share my screen for just a second and just briefly summarize what uh, SWAN has done in the past year, which has been really, really exciting. Hold on one second. There we go. All right. This is um, just a really brief summary of what SWAN has done in the past year. And it wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't had the ability to grow through COVID. Honestly, the, the silver lining of COVID is how do you take um, an Austin-based angel network that work that wants to grow and make it happen. And with this, all this virtual, it has made it really possible. And it wouldn't have been possible without the collaboration with SVP. So uh, when I look at what we, what we grew last year, we grew 36 new angels. Half of those are from Dallas. Uh, we committed 4.6 million of capital, which is, it's, real money. It's, it may not be a big amount of money in some people's worlds, but in the startup space it is, and 11 investments. Um, I'm really proud that 46% of the people that we've invested in are underrepresented founders. And um, I, you know, I, I, liked, I liked something I read this weekend about um, a fellow who passed away recently um, who has written the book, Why Should All the White Guys Have All the Fun? Uh, why should they get all the money? So my, um, I'm, I'm excited about these founders that that we're we're backing. When I look at the partners, we're partnering. Um, we're excited to be going into Pegasus Park and the water cooler. We want to invest in more healthcare deals. We've got some wonderful partnerships uh, with venture firms. Um, and if if you look on that screen, you'll see everything from the diversity pledge to um, the Rice Alliance to Div Inc. So we do uh, take grant dollars and put those to work in the community. So we're trying to help entrepreneurs um, and groups like Div Inc and Impact Assets here in Dallas make that possible. Um, and so when you look at what we've done in the past year, I would say about 60 first, well, 55 or so percent has been in clean technology. And then about uh, 35 or such percent has been in healthcare. And then the balance has been in education and FinTech. And when I look at a couple of these companies, you know, they're such early stage. So many of them are pre-impact where they've really got the metrics that they can share on what they're doing. But I'll just mention a couple um, that we've invested in in the past, we've been the seed, and one is in the climate risk space. It's Aqueous, and they have got a software solution that is providing incentives and incentive projects for energy savings, for smarter utilities, and smarter water consumption. And as a result of what they've done so far with their software solution, which started out as water conservation, but it's very data driven. Um, they have helped save 20.5 million kilowatt hours annual energy savings, 15 million gallons of water, um, 15.6 million of incentive payments, and they've worked on 14,000 projects. Um, another one that we just recently heard from that's uh, come back to us for a follow-on investment is called Binary Bridge. Heather, sorry, I'm gonna have to interrupt you because I know we're coming sure. up right at the end of time. Um, sure. just wanted, um, sure. This is really great information. Thank you for sharing just some really great examples about sure. how where the investments are going. Um, wanted to just maybe ask one quick wrap-up question to the group um, and then pass it over to Tony for any concluding thoughts. 
Um, just, you know, uh, Heather, you, you kind of alluded it, alluded to it earlier around, you know, reaching this point in your career, you, you really wanted to kind of shift the way you were thinking about um, this work. Just curious about what brings you all to this space of impact investing. What is, what is your why for, for being involved with this, with this field? And Heather, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, I have always been a nerd when it comes to leadership and um, creators. And I love being around them and I get inspired by these entrepreneurs. And um, I'm also inspired by uh, these founders, underrepresented founders who don't get enough love, don't get enough attention and don't get enough capital. And I want to help them. How about you, Dominique? I would say um, it's making sure that other people have the same opportunities that I did, I think. Um, I was raised by a teenage mother and, and was kind of the first person in my immediate family to go to school. And I think that um, that's kind of what brings me to being in the world of impact investment is, especially in the particular areas that, that we're really focused on is, is really seeing how that can have such a profound impact on one's upward economic mobility. So that's what's motivating me today. And, and I'm happy to go next. I, I do want to say one thing. The, uh, I know there was a reference to the Fed having a balance sheet. Uh, to be clear, we don't have a balance sheet for investing. Um, and, uh, but we drive capital. We bring people to the table and get really excited about that. But what gets me excited, and Heather you know, pointed to this concept of capital being recycled. And uh, that's what excites me about impact investing. Impact investing is a space where unlike philanthropic dollars, which are really important. You have capital going in that can take a bit more risk, but if it works, it's, it just keeps on recycling and it comes back, it creates a return and goes back into having impact. And uh, I think there's a lot that can be done in this space. And what I really am excited about is that young people are excited about this notion of impact in a way that my generation certainly wasn't. So I just see a terrific future ahead. I think that's a great way to end. And I think just a, just a wonderful representation. Each of you has bring your own stories, your own perspectives, your own expertise to this work. And I think that's really what's going to what's required for us to really push the impact investing field to the next level is for each of each of us to continue bringing our skills and talents and expertise, which is what I think SVP does a great job of, of helping folks convene uh, or helping to, to convene the folks who are doing that as well. So thank you, thank you to each of you for providing just a small snippet of your perspective. I know we could talk for a lot longer, but uh, time is constraining us, but I um, really appreciate your thoughts and um, we'll pass it over to Tony. You're muted, Tony. Thank you all so much for your time and uh, for the brilliance that you bring to the conversation. Um, I just want to echo my thanks to each of you for being with us. I am a particular fan of public uh, commitments. And although I heard you make one that you will be on a public stage here in Dallas with us. Um, and so I think we've already talked about that as the third Friday in October for our Big Bang Conference, which we do in conjunction with the Federal Reserve of Dallas here, which have been fantastic partners to us, thought leaders and great participants in helping us think about uh, wonderful and impactful ways of doing good in the world. For those of you who are in the <clears throat> excuse me, in the audience and would like to get involved in social venture partners, we would love to have you. As you can see, the diversity on our panel is what we are all about. We believe that bringing that diversity together in thought leadership in generation in gender and in race is what makes this world a better place. We would be happy to have your talents as well. So please visit our website at Social Venture Partners Dallas and join us in our work. I understand that courtrooms everywhere in the United States today are full of weddings. For some reason, 02, whatever, 22, 20, something about the twos is making everybody get married today. So it's a great day for love. Go spread some out there in the community. And we look forward to being with, being with you again uh, very soon. Thank you all and take care. Bye. Thank you.